Right guys, welcome back to A-Level Psychology. Today we're going to be looking at free will and determinism, which comes up in the Issues and Debates chapter and is a paper 3 topic. We'll cover the outline section first, including plenty of examples, and then we'll move on to the evaluation points. If you're interested in a bunch of exam questions with model answers, including an essay and an application essay, then you can click on the exam video at the top of the screen now and check that out. I will of course link it at the end of the video as well. And just before we get started, as usual, if you find this video useful, a quick hit on the like button to let me know would be amazing. So here are the key terms for the topic, just so that you can keep an eye out for them as we go through the video. There's quite a few in this one, but hopefully they won't cause any confusion by the time we get to the end. So let's start with the debate. The free will determinism debate explores the question of whether people are able to decide for themselves if they should act in a certain way, or if our behavior is the result of forces over which we have absolutely no control. So we'll start with free will, which is the idea that humans are essentially self-determining and free to choose their own thoughts and their own actions at all times. Now, believing in free will doesn't mean that we don't believe in biological and environmental forces that can have some kind of influence on our behavior, but it does mean that we are able to reject those forces if we want, because ultimately we are in control of everything that happens in our lives in terms of behavior, actions, thoughts, and so on. The concept of free will is one of the fundamental beliefs in humanistic psychology, and actually, the humanistic approach is one of the only approaches and one of the only examples really that you'll come across in the psychology curriculum that advocates for free will. So if you ever get asked for an example of free will or if you ever want to put an example of free will in an essay, the humanistic approach with Rogers and Maslow and the hierarchy of needs and self-actualization, that is probably what you would want to talk about because it is one of the only examples that exists in the curriculum. Now, determinism, on the other hand, is the opposite of free will, and it suggests that all behavior is caused by internal or external forces and is therefore predictable. Examples of external forces could be things like rewards and conditioning, whereas examples of internal forces could be things like hormones, neurotransmitters, and genes. Now, just to keep things interesting, there are two main types of determinism. Those are hard determinism and soft determinism. Hard determinism suggests that all human behavior has a cause, and in principle it should be possible to identify and describe that cause. The assumption is that everything we think and do is set out and determined by internal or external forces that are beyond our control. Another basic assumption of hard determinism is that free will is nothing but an illusion. So, you might think you have control, but actually you don't, everything has been predetermined for you. Okay, that is hard determinism. Soft determinism, on the other hand, was proposed by James in 1890 as a less extreme stance than hard determinism. It suggests that all human behavior has a cause, however, there is some room for flexibility, and people have a certain amount of conscious control over the way they behave, but only within the realms of what they know. So, in this case, people are given a snifter of free will, but not much. Okay, so like in the picture, the guy has the free will to decide where the carriage is going to go, but doesn't have the free will to stop the train. Okay, and in psychology, what you tend to find is that approaches that have got a cognitive element to them generally advocate soft determinism. Okay, so things like social learning theory where we learn through observation, but we then have the choice as to whether or not we actually want to carry out that behavior. Okay, and if you can't remember what I'm talking about there with social learning theory, I will link the video to it at the top of the screen and you can have a look at that. Now, just to keep things further interesting, hard determinism can also be further subdivided into three individual types of determinism. You've got biological determinism, environmental determinism, and psychic determinism, all as types of hard determinism. So, biological determinism is the belief that behavior is caused by biological influences that we can't control. For example, the influence of our autonomic nervous system on the stress response, or the influence of genes or neurotransmitters on mental health. 
For example, in year one in psychopathology, you looked at the biological approach to OCD. In that topic, there was research by Neistat et al. from 2010 who found that 68% of identical twins shared symptoms of OCD, which suggested some form of genetic influence to the condition. Now that is a biologically deterministic approach to OCD. And you'll find examples like that all over psychology. Wherever there's a biological explanation for something, you can be fairly certain that it's going to be a biologically deterministic view of the behavior in question. Whether that's biological explanations for crime in the forensic topic, biological explanations for aggression, stress, gender, OCD, anything. Now, it must also be said at this point that modern psychologists usually recognize the fact that environment can mediate the influence of biology, okay? So as a general rule, when you see a biological explanation for a behavior, there will usually be a little paragraph that just says that the environment can mediate a little bit, okay? But that still is a biologically deterministic view of the behavior. Now, environmental determinism refers to the view that behavior is caused by forces outside of the individual. It's effectively behaviorism. Any approach or any explanation that's got behaviorism in it, that is going to be environmentally deterministic. Okay, so if you take B.F. Skinner, for example, he argued that all behavior comes from conditioning, and whilst we might think we're acting independently, our experience of choice is merely the sum total of our conditioning history that's been acting on us our entire lives. An example of that from the curriculum is the behaviorist approach to phobias, which suggests that phobias are acquired through classical conditioning and are maintained through operant conditioning. Okay, like I said before, any behaviorist approach really, learning theory to attachment is another one that would be environmentally deterministic. Okay, so approaches like this suggest that, at least to some extent, our behavior is determined by our environment. And the final type of hard determinism is psychic determinism. Now, this refers to the idea that all human behavior is the result of childhood experiences, innate drives, unresolved conflicts, the id, the ego, and the superego. It is, effectively, all based around the psychodynamic approach. An example of this is the psychodynamic explanation for gender identity. The short version of it is that the development of gender identity is based on the successful resolution of the Oedipus or the Electra complex, which in turn is based on the successful identification with the same-sex parent. If this isn't successful, it will affect your behavior later in life. If it is successful, it will also affect your behavior later in life. Okay, so it is effectively saying that behavior in terms of gender identity is determined by the successful or the unsuccessful identification with your parents. Again, as with biological determinism and environmental determinism, you'll find examples of this all over the curriculum. The authoritarian personality, for example, is a psychodynamic explanation for obedience because people are displacing resentment for their fathers onto others, resentment that has come about due to traumatic parenting. Therefore, it is psychic determinism. Okay, you've also got maternal deprivation as an explanation for crime, which also takes a psychodynamic approach and therefore suffers from psychic determinism. Now, just to finish off, I want to spend a couple of minutes on the scientific emphasis on causal explanations. Deterministic approaches are considered more scientific because one of the basic principles of science is that every event in the universe has a cause which can be discovered and explained using general laws. Science seeks to discover whether X causes Y, and deterministic approaches allow us to explore that because deterministic approaches believe that all behavior has a cause that can be determined. Okay, therefore, deterministic approaches places a scientific emphasis on causal explanations. Okay, that one's really, really important. There is an exam question about this in the exam questions video, and it is also named in the spec that you need to have a working knowledge of what it means that there is a scientific emphasis on causal explanations. Okay, so please make sure that you are happy with that. All right, I hope all of that has made sense. On the screen now, you can see a quick reminder of the keywords and what they mean. And we're now going to move on to the second half of the video, which is the evaluation points. 
I've got five evaluation points for you in this video. That's slightly more than usual, but that's because there are quite a few to pick from. You don't have to know them all. You can pick and choose which ones you want to learn and which ones you want to use in an essay. I'm going to give you the bullet pointed versions of the evaluation points so that I can talk you through them, but you can find the full written out paragraphs in my model essay in the exam practice video, which again, I will link at the end. Okay, so we're going to start with an argument for the case of free will, and that is that it has good face validity. Everyday experiences gives us the impression that we are constantly exercising free will. We choose what we're going to wear on a daily basis. We choose what music we're going to listen to. We choose how we're going to act in certain situations. Okay, that gives us the impression that we are always exercising free will. Okay. Furthermore, research has shown that people with an internal locus of control, so cast your mind back to social influence here, these are people who act according to their own values and morals and believe that they have a high degree of control over their own behavior. Research has shown that these people tend to be more mentally healthy. Okay. And this was shown by Roberts, who in his research found that adolescents with a strong belief in determinism were at significantly greater risk of developing depression. Okay, so that shows that even if we don't have free will, the fact that we think we have it seems to have a positive impact on our minds and our behavior. And that is definitely a strength. However, that being said, neurological studies of decision making have revealed evidence against free will. So Liebert in 1985 and soon in 2008 instructed participants to choose a random moment to flick their wrists whilst their brain activity was being measured. The participants had to say when they felt the conscious will to move, and the brain scans demonstrated that unconscious brain activity leading up to the conscious decision to move came half a second before the participants' conscious awareness of having made that choice. So it seemed like the brain had already decided what was going to happen before the participants were actually aware of what was going to happen. So the question is, who or what is making that decision? And it suggests that even our most basic experiences of free will, in this case, flicking your wrist whenever you want to, are decided and determined before we are aware of them. So that suggests that it is predetermined rather than a case of free will. However, a strength of determinism is that it is consistent with the aims of science. The idea that human behavior is orderly and predictable and obeys laws places psychology on equal footing with the other natural sciences. In addition, the idea that human behavior is predictable and can be controlled has led to the development of treatments and therapies and interventions that have benefited millions of people. For example, the development of drug treatments for mental health disorders like depression and schizophrenia have come about due to the belief that human behavior is predetermined, predictable, and can be controlled. Okay. On top of that, the mere existence of conditions like schizophrenia, where people can experience a loss of control over thoughts and behavior, would cast doubt on the idea of free will, because who would choose to experience those things. However, despite those obvious benefits, many psychologists and legal experts don't favor a deterministic approach, because if behavior is determined by outside forces, then it provides a potential excuse for criminal acts. In a court of law, offenders are held responsible for their actions. The main principle of our legal systems is that a defendant exercise their free will in committing a crime. If we were to start introducing determinism into the law, it would start causing problems. For example, in 1981, Stephen Mobley argued that he was born to kill after killing a pizza shop manager because his family had a disposition towards violence and aggressive behavior. Now, although his argument was rejected in court, a hard deterministic position could be undesirable because removing free will provides an excuse allowing people to mitigate their own liability and that could lead to problematic legal issues regarding the nature of responsibility and intent. Okay, so that suggests that in the real world, deterministic arguments do not work. So to finish off, it's clear that both sides of the argument have merits and equally have problems to contend with. 
In reality, it's unlikely that we'll ever be able to discover if we truly have free will or not. Right now, at this point in time, it may be more useful to adopt an interactionist position, which could provide a nice compromise between the two extremes without going to the extremes. For example, social learning theory advocates reciprocal determinism, which suggests that people are influenced by their environment, but they also influence their environment through the behaviours that they choose to perform. Each impacts on the other. This is an example of soft determinism, because this element of choice suggests that there is some free will in the way people behave. This also might provide a more agreeable position, because it accepts that there is cause and effect, which works for scientific approaches, but it also allows us some choice, which we've seen is important for well-being, but is also important in terms of the bigger picture for legal issues and things like that. Okay, and that brings us to the end of the video. I hope it's all made sense, and I hope it's been useful. Head over to the exam practice video for some examples of how this could pop up in an exam, and for a couple of model essays as well. If you found it useful, please remember to let me know by hitting the like button. Thank you very much for listening, and I will see you in the next one.